Hello, and welcome to Lab Activity 1, Introducing R. And this part is going to be the first sample session, your very first sample session in R. Be excited. Previously, you installed R, you downloaded it first, then you installed it, and then you created the necessary file structure. In this activity, you're going to be showing your work in statistics. Remember what every teacher has taught you from day one in math class. Show your work. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to double click on the blue R icon, the one with the little arrow down there. It's going to bring up this. Typical boilerplate for the start of R tells us the R version if we want, the copyright, what platform I'm running it on. You can tell I'm running this on a Windows 64-bit machine. Some more information. And then a red greater than sign with a blinking vertical dash. This is the what's called the cursor, or the, the blinking vertical dash is called the cursor. The greater than sign is called the prompt, if that matters. This entire window is called the console window. We know it's called the console window because at the top it's titled our console. The importance of the console window is that in order for R to actually do anything, it has to be run over on the console window side. But we're not going to be doing our work on the console window side. We're going to be doing it in our script window. So the first step we're going to do, even before we get to the script window, I should have mentioned this first, is we must set the working directory. The working directory is the default place that R looks for files for this script. And since this is lab 1A, we're going to set the working directory to lab 1. In Max, there's going to be an option up here called miscellaneous, or just MISC. That's where you're going to go to set your working directory. In Windows, it's under File, Change Directory, and click. And then it pops up the typical Browse for Folder window. And all I have to do now is remember where. But since I set up my file folders appropriately, I know exactly where. Lab 1. And once I have clicked it, it tells you down here with the folder number and hit OK. And now lab1 is my default folder. Now I'll start a new script. In Windows it's called New Script. In Max it's called New Document. Clicked it. The thing now on the right is going to be called my script window. The thing on my left is still my console window. The thing on my right is where I'm going to type in all my work, which allows me to save it, hand it in to show my work to prove that I did it correctly. And the thing on the right is where all the work actually gets done. So let me type in the script from the appendix for, for lab one. That was fast. Any line that has a pound sign in it, or starts with a pound sign, is going to be ignored by R. It's not going to be ignored by the person who reads this, however. These are called comment characters. And they're called comment characters because it allows the coder, that would be you, the analyst, to leave comments for people coming along behind them. So you only need one. I can have three, five, just to indent it a little bit. Notice I'm doing all my work over on the script window. Now let's talk through the lines here. Set seed. Whenever you're creating random numbers or drawing random numbers, whichever verbiage you wish, the computer program has to have a seed. It's a seed, it's just as a seed is the start of a plant, the random number seed is the start of the random number sequence. Because computers can't create random numbers, they create what are called pseudo-random numbers. They behave like random numbers, but they're not truly random. When you set the seed with a specific number, you're able to create the same sequence of, quote, random numbers time and time again. 
The second line is the line that actually creates or generates or draws those random numbers. We know that because the function starts with an R and ends with an abbreviation for a, uh, for a distribution. Here that distribution is the uniform distribution. Again, starting with R means you're going to draw random numbers from it. it the R unif function takes three. It requires one, but takes three slots. The first slot is the number of uniform random numbers that you want to have generated. The second is the smallest you want that random number to be. And the third is the maximum, the largest you want it to be. So I'm going to run those two. And to run those two in Windows, I've got some options. I can either highlight and hit Control R on the keyboard, or I can highlight and click on this button, which is Run Line or Selection. Or I can highlight and click on Edit, and then click on Run Line or Selection. Three options. If if I have my hand on the mouse, I'm probably going to be clicking on this button. If my hands are on the keyboard, I'll be doing Control R. For Macintosh people, it's going to be Command Enter. It's going to be the keyboard shortcut, and then you're going to have menu shortcuts up above. Command Enter. So since this is a PC, Control R runs it. Notice what happens. It took what I had highlighted over here and sent it over and ran it in the console window. First thing it did is it set the seed to 370. Second thing is it drew 50,000 random uniform numbers, smallest being 10, largest being 20, and stored it in a variable x. And that's it. It didn't print out anything because we didn't ask it to print out anything. It just did what we told it to. Line 3. Let me just break that up for a moment. There's an X, plain old X. I can hit Control R, and what that does is it prints out everything that's in the variable X. Well, we know what's in the variable X. It's 50,000 random numbers between 10 and 20. So that's fi that's everything that's stored in X. All 50,000 random ver numbers between 10 and 20. That's a lot of numbers. So instead of printing them all out, in brackets, I can specify I just want to see numbers 1 through 10. So this will give me the first 10 values of x. Control R. If you ran this in the order that I just did, these will be the exact same numbers you have. In fact, just to demonstrate that, I'm going to run just these two lines the line that creates the x variable and the line that prints out the top 10. Control R, pay attention to the numbers, and they've changed. And do the same thing again. Just those two lines, Control R, again, the numbers have changed. Now, if I had highlighted the set seed as well, so highlighted those top three and Control R'd it, I'd get the same numbers every time. Control R every time. Gives me the same exact numbers. Because I'm setting the seed, which in essence sets the sequence of random uniform values. And that sequence starts with 13.9, follows up with 10.5, then 11.9, etc. So that's why your random numbers and mine should be the same. But only if we run it in this sequence. Control R. Link function tells us how many values are stored in whatever variable you put here. So length of x tells us how many values are in x. We already know how many values are in x. It's 50,000. Control R, 50,000. If I want to find the arithmetic mean, or what people usually call the average, the function is mean, and then inside the parentheses, the name of the variable. So the mean of x is probably going to be somewhere around 15. Control R. It's pretty close to 15, 14.99354. The median is another measure of center. It's also it's another average. 
The median should also be close to 15. Control R. Here the median is 14.9844. Not quite as close to 15, but still close to 15. I could calculate the variance, the standard deviation, and something called the interquartile range. The function to calculate the variance is VAR. The function to calculate the standard deviation is just SD. And the function to calculate the interquartile range is just IQR. Make sure that you have the correct case. Lowercase letters are not the same as uppercase letters. So little v, little a, little r will give you the variance of 8.28. Capital V, capital A, capital R won't. Case counts everywhere. So var of big X is not going to be the same as var of little x because big X and little x are different variables. Here, since I haven't created a variable big X, it doesn't exist. So the variance, the standard deviation, the interquartile range. I can also count the minimum, calculate the minimum, the maximum, and the quantiles. The minimum should be around 10. The maximum should be around 20. And the quantiles gives us the minimum, the first, second, third quartiles, and then the maximum values. The, this is also, the minimum is also called the zeroth quantile. The 50th percentile, the second quantile, quartile is also called the median. Notice that it matches the value for the median that we calculated earlier. The fourth quartile is also called the maximum. Quartiles 3 and 1 will be important when we calculate the interquartile range by hand because the interquartile range, the IQR, is just the third quartile minus the first quartile. We can, if we wish, calculate something called a trimmed mean by specifying the optional parameter trim. What this does is it trims off the upper and lower 2.5% and calculates the mean of what remains. The trimmed mean is more robust than the full mean, but it's less robust than the median. Robust means that it's not sensitive to outliers. This function gives us all quantiles from the first percentile to the hundredth percentile. And how do I know that? function is quantile, so it returns those percentiles of the variable x. And which quantiles does it return? Gives us all quantiles between 1 and 100 divided by 100. So it's 1 divided by 100 all the way up through 100 divided by 100. In other words, from 1%, which is 1 over 100, all the way up to 100%, which is 100 over 100. Now let's look at a box plot. I'm only going to highlight this box plot of x for now. Control R. There's a box plot of x. That easy. I challenge you to do a box plot in Excel quite so easy. This is the minimum. This one's the maximum. Thick bar is the median. First quartile. Third quartile. So this distance is the interquartile range. About 50% of the data falls between those two lines or within the box. Contrast that with the histogram. Again, I'm just running hist of x. Gives us information about the same variable, different information. Histogram is very useful for determining the distribution of the data, whether or not it matches any s named distribution. And we'll learn about we will learn about a few named distributions in chapter four at the end of chapter four. So you've got time. But if you notice, the heights are all about the same. A little jumpy, uh, jiggliness, but only because it's random numbers. They're all about the same height, and that's characteristic of a uniform distribution. If our x's were not uniformly distributed, but say they were normally distributed, the distribution would not be flat at the top. It would have a bell shape to it. So let me go ahead and run those four lines, starting with the PNG function, ending with the dev.off function and notice nothing got popped up. 
over on the console window it says null device 1. Here's what happens. First line, PNG, what that set, uh, tells R to do is open a file, an image file, a PNG, which is a type of image file, call that image file 01boxplot.png. Make sure the height of that file or of the image itself is 4 inches, the width is 4 inches, and the resolution is 600 pixels per inch. A pixel is just a little dot on the screen. Once it's, that file is open, we created some definitions for our box plot, then created the box plot, and then we close the file by running dev.off, open and close parentheses. So these four lines opened an image file, 4 inches by 4 inches, resolution of 600 dots per inch, set some parameters about that file, or about the graphic, create the graphic, and then close the file. Now we can do the same thing with the histogram. Highlight those four, control R. Again, nothing popped up because what happened? PNG opened the file 01histogram.png, made sure the image was going to be four inches by four inches with the same resolution of 600 dots per inch. Same parameters for the histogram, create the histogram, and shut the file. The shutting of the file said null device, create, uh, forced R to say null device 1. What that just means is there's no graphics file already open. If I had a box plot open and then I did the histogram, it would say Windows 2, and that would tell me that there's two windows that are open besides the console. The script and the graphic of the box plot that I opened before. And I can actually close this graphic of the box plot by clicking on the red X as usual or by running dev.off. Null device came up, said you don't have any more graphics windows open. And note what happens if I try to run dev.off one more time, I get an error because it can't shut down the original device. So that was kind of important, but now I ran these this these two sets of lines. Control R, nothing popped up. Where are they? Well, they're in your working directory, where they should be. And here's your working directory. Lab one, in lab activities, inside of stat methods, in your documents folder. And notice you've got the box plot and the histogram saved here. Now the last thing to do, assuming we're done with our analysis, the last thing to do is to save the script. File, save, or save as. You can also do Control S in Windows or Command S in Mac. So when you do that, this pops up. We're going to save this as script.r. Enter. Wait, where did it get saved? in your working directory. There's the script. And that's all there is to this. Hopefully this was helpful walking you through this, understanding the different parts. The actual script here is not so important as understanding the importance of the working directory and what the PNG dev off function uh, combination does. And also that you can get a lot of stuff done with very little typing. Box plot, histogram, etc. Hopefully, this was helpful. Take care. Amen.